be a coward at the time of Jesus' death. So, sorry. Here's my conclusions of this evidence. We've given the depth of the evidence of the historical variety of the gospel, veracity of the denied witness. Now, here's the conclusion of what, what that gives us, what that helps us on the table. In Mark chapter 14, 66, 72, as we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony, why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? From Balkan's work we know, and from early tradition, many other sources we could go into if we wanted to, we know that the Gospel of Mark was written on the basis of Peter's testimony. So as we know that, why is it why is Mark put in the denial of Peter? Why put it in if it didn't happen? It would be propaganda. So it has a strong historical base. Also, why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus' death and be bold in preaching in Jerusalem? If Dr. Pryor says that the myth of Jesus that he wrote from the dead started right at the beginning, why go into Jerusalem and preach? Because you'd soon be found out to be a liar. What changed Peter from being a coward to courageous? The account of Jesus' death has a ring of historical truth about it. In Mark chapter 16, 9, Mary Madeleine, a woman of ill repute, is the first to bear witness of Jesus. Why make a woman who has only half the testimony of a man in Jewish court, why make a woman the first witness of Jesus? In Mark, we learn that Jesus died on a cross in Mark 15, 25, 37. He was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea in Mark 15, 43. And he was seen in the resurrection by Mary Madeleine. This resurrection is stated a bold resurrection of Jesus. What is interesting, these facts that we affirm are facts that the vast majority of scholars would agree with. They wouldn't disagree with that. They might not agree with the supernatural interpretation, but they would not disagree with the basic facts that Christ died, the tomb was empty, and the church preached a resurrected Christ. So our research and our study confirm are confirmed in what scholars already accept. It falls in line with the work done by E.P. Sanders. So if our historical source material is in the first century, if it's reliable and based on eyewitness accounts, if it fits the historical context and accords with the scholarship of more scholars, I conclude the following. The idea that the disciples were lying makes no sense with the facts that we know. Why lie? What would they gain in lying? What would they gain in doing that? They gain no money, no sex, no power. People who start new movements aim at those three things. The disciples were not aiming at any of those things. If you were lying, why would you invent that your Messiah died, was a criminal, that died as a criminal? How would that enhance what you were trying to do? People would have just seen it as silly, so why preach it? If they lied, the enemies could have produced the body of Jesus and that would have exposed them. 
And why again preach in Jerusalem your lies? They would have been exposed in no time. How come nobody, if they were lying, how come not one of them recanted? When the disciples of him said they saw the golden plate, some later on went on to recant. But what about delusions? Maybe they had an illusion or a vision. Well, it goes against the historical fact that the early church disciples believed in a physical resurrection. If it was an illusion or a vision, why do they insist on a real resurrection? Why not just say they had a vision? Why teach it was a physical resurrection? If it was an illusion, how could they recover from their defeat? When Jesus died, the disciples were defeated. They were not in a psychological fit state to respond to any vision or anything. They were utterly defeated. They had been beaten by this. They were not in a fit state to have visions. They were or to have grief illus illusions as they were so disappointed so lost so shattered they were in no mental state to be to induce any such phenomena then the other option is Jesus could rise from the dead it fits all the historical facts it makes perfectly clear why Peter was a coward one minute and bold the next it makes sense to put Mary as the first witness because she just was. It happened. It makes perfect sense the disciples Jesus rose from the dead as they were crushed by Jesus' death and were not expecting anything. And then the next minute they could be bold. It makes perfect sense and that's why Mark told it. You might say miracles do not happen but that is just a philosophical argument and if you were honest you would say the only way to know if a miracle happened is to check the historical data you might say there are minor contradictions within the Gospels on the historical resurrection those historical contradictions are only a way of looking at the Gospels what about where all the Gospels agree on various historical facts? What about the fact that these so-called contradictions are really just a say that one Gospel says one angel, another Gospel says two angels, another Gospel says a man? It's obviously looking at things from a different perspective. If I say there was one angel at the tomb and my friend says there were two angels if they if I say there was only one and my friend said there was only two that would be a contradiction but if I say there was one angel and my friend says there were two angels I'm not being dogmatic I'm just giving you a general statement so when you say there are contradictions in the Gospels you're putting words in the mouth of the Gospels. You may say that Christianity came from Greek and Egyptian gods. Plutarch in Greek and e Egyptian uh, gods shows there is no there was